Hey everybody, I'm Tim, I'm with Hawkridge Systems, and today I'm proud to present to you automating your designs using SolidWorks. And with us today is Dane, and Dane's one of our senior application engineers out of the Edmonton office. He has a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Alberta, and is one of the most fun and knowledgeable engineers you meet. I had the opportunity to spend a few weeks with him last year during our conferences, as we traveled across the country, and it was really fun to watch how he connects common design tasks to simplified methods using SOLIDWORKS. Now, when he's not training new users on the best way to accomplish their goals, he's doing that all online today, but hopefully we can get back to the classroom soon. Uh, he spends his time de developing content, like you'll see today. We also post a lot of that stuff on our blog and uh, YouTube channel, as well as performing software demonstrations. So I'm really happy to present to you Dave. Ah, uh, Tim, you missed the uh, the cue for my clap track there. I, I think oh, we got to do uh, this again. My mistake. I'll, I'll get that up for the end. All right. <laughs> all right. I, I need to hear the round of applause. I I, I need the audience feedback. Gets me yeah, going. Hopefully. hopefully they'll take advantage of that question pane, and uh, mm -hmm. we'll make a, a fun presentation. But yeah, in all seriousness, thanks, Tim. Such a nice intro. Tim's a pretty awesome guy too. I, I talk him up, but we we don't really have time for that. Not me today. <laughs> For the sake of time, let's let's get this show on the road here. I'm going to just turn off my webcam here, but Tim and I will pop pop in and out every now and then just so you make sure you're not watching a video and that there are actually humans present and we can have some nice social interaction time. I'd like to just start off by thanking you guys for choosing to attend my webinar today. So in this session, we're going to talk about different ways that you can use SolidWorks to automate your design process. So we're going to start simple with automating just the creation of features using library features, and then we're going to finish off with fully automating unique configurations based off rules, design criteria, and a user input form using DriveWorks Express. We'll also look at how equations, global variables, and even Excel can be used to drive and configure your designs. So automation is a great technique to help streamline your workflows. It can speed up design time, reduce rework, and standardize common features and parts. So library feature parts are a way to automate the creation of features in your parts or assemblies. If you find yourself recreating the same features time and time again, then making them a design library feature will be the first step in automating your designs. You'll be able to drag and drop the repetitive features into new models, which will save you time and the redundancy of remodeling. So these on the screen right now are the necessary steps for creating a design library feature. Step one, you have to create a source part. Step two, you need to understand the locating external references. Then you have to select your desired features and then use the save as command and change the file type. And then you organize your dimensions inside of a new folder structure. So today I'm going to create a logo that I'm going to automatically drag into new parts and it's gonna cut that logo into all of my new designs. So the very first step is to create a source part. This part will not be used in any of your models, but will be used to define the library features and will be the file to edit and manipulate if you need to make any changes. So it can be as simple or as complex as you want. So for our example, it's just going to be this simple block here with our Hawkridge logo cut into it. So it is only two features, but you can get this as complex as you need. So since the feature I want to automate is the cut, let's take a look at the sketch. It has three external references. The very first reference is the plane that this sketch is on. The point that's coincident with the origin right here, so kind of what I'm using to locate the center of it, that is also an external reference. So my sketch is referencing the origin, which is external to the sketch. The sketch is on a plane which is external to the sketch. And then finally, my third reference is this bottom edge that I give a parallel relation to, to help orient. So the coincident relation locates it, and this parallel relation will help orient it. 
So of course, this is I'm, I'm going to need some sort of hard edge to reference. I'm not going to be able to use this specific design library feature part if I have a curved edge. So then I'd have to make a configured one, and that is definitely doable as well. So if you don't know exactly what external references you have in your sketch, where they are, there's a tool for that. And we can display the external relations by using the filter in the display delete relations tool. So that little icon that popped up on the top right, that's the display delete relations that lives on the sketch tab of your command manager. And what it'll do is it'll pull up in the property manager on the left side, all of your relations. And there's a nice little filter where you can filter it for external relations. And I can see that this sketch does in fact have two external relations, the parallel relation and the coincident relation. And as I use this sketch inside of a new feature, I have to attach those relations to something else. So once I'm satisfied with the feature, we need to save the part as a library feature part. So the trick is that we need to communicate with SolidWorks what features are going to be imported and which features are just for reference. So we establish this by selecting the features we want to drag and drop into other models, and then we hit the Save As button. So this is the most crucial step that most people miss. So you need to pre-select in your feature tree what features you want to be drag and drop, and then you hit that Save As button. Then all we have to do is change the file type and choose a location that's easily accessible. So you can see I'm saving mine to the design library, and I change the file type to the SLD LFP for a SOLIDWORKS library feature part. So after you save as a library feature part, some changes happen inside of your feature tree. The icon of the part file has changed, and there are a few new folders at the top. We have this references, locating dimensions, and internal dimensions folders. So the reference folder displays all the external references needed to locate the design library feature. So we can see in there, we have the placement plane, the edge that needs to be parallel to, and the sketch point. The locating dimensions are for dimensions to entities external to the feature and are used for positioning the sketch. In this example, there are no locating dimensions because the position is defined by the external references and not the dimensions. So in the property manager, after dragging and dropping, there'll be a section to manipulate locating dimensions. So internal dimensions are for sizing the sketch and also have their own section in the property manager of the design library feature. So there's also a little L added to all the features that are included in the drag and drop operability of the design library features. This helps to clarify what features are going to be added and which will be in fact left behind. So since only the cut extrude has the L, when I drag this into another part, only the cut extrude will happen. So let's see this in action inside of SolidWorks. So here we go. I have modeled myself this part, and anytime I'm making content here at Hawkridge, I have to, in fact, put my little Hawkridge logo on there and brand it so no one steals my amazing ideas. So that's what I want to do. I do it a lot, so I don't want to have to model that hawk every time. That's a fairly complex sketch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my design library, and right here I have my hawk logo, and I'm going to drag it, and since it's a sketch, that I'm bringing over, it has to drop onto a plane. So I'm gonna drag it, and I'm just gonna drop it onto this plane two here. Now we can see on the left-hand side, if I had different configurations, I could choose the configuration. So my configuration could change the size if I didn't wanna use my size dimensions, or maybe different ones for connecting to a curved edge instead of a linear edge, it would have different references. But for now, I only made one, this one, usually works for me every time. So I have to connect my first references. So I can see edge one is a reference needed and I get the nice little preview of that source part. So I need some sort of edge to get the bottom parallel with. I'll click on that and then I need a locating point. So I'm just gonna grab my origin and just like that, my features come through. 
So if it's really complex, SolidWorks color codes them as well. So everything yellow is being added. Everything that's not yellow is already existed inside of the part. If I had locating dimensions instead of these references, I could come in here and manipulate them. And if I had some internal size dimensions for the sketch itself, those would be located right here. And I could edit and manipulate those at will. So just like that, coming in and I added that pretty complex sketch fairly easily. Hey Dean. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I got to tell you, I just learned something. I, I didn't know that you could do that. The way you drag and drop that onto the plane by having the plane shown there and then passing your cursor over the plane, it picked up that inference. That's pretty cool. I, uh, I Anything didn't... to save a step, hey? Uh, I like it. <laughs> Anything yeah, to a... save a step. I love it. Thank you. Nice. Great, great, great point, Tim. Yeah, because sometimes I, I do these little subtle habits and forget why I do them and right there. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Love it. So as a little additional bonus, it's not actually in the agenda. I'm going to talk about smart components. So with smart components, you can add assembly feature actions to your part files. This will allow the part file to add assembly features like cutting a specific tolerance or adding necessary hardware. So in this example on the screen here, you can see that the bushing is used to bore its own hole that comes with the necessary tolerancing. This can really speed up the design process because you look up the tolerance once, set it in the part file, then every time you use the part, you don't need to look it up again, and you don't need to make that cut feature. So one click doing a ton of manual operations. So the, the first time there's a little more setup, but afterwards it, it saves tons of time, the more you use it. So these are the steps on the screen here for creating smart components. So you generally create smart components from components that you use frequently that require the addition of associated components and features. When you make a component smart, you associate the other components and features with the smart component inside of a defining assembly. When you insert the smart component into another assembly, you can choose whether or not to insert the associated components and features. So the very first step, just like our design library, is to create this defining assembly. Then, you make sure that it has all the included parts and features within that assembly. So once you're in that defining assembly, you choose a component that you want to make smart. And then inside of the property manager, you can select the components and features you would like to bring with the smart component. After that, your component's ready to test in a new assembly. So the example that I'm going to show you guys here, I've chosen to make this joist bracket a smart component. And that's going to automatically add the hardware and holes for the hardware. So what you see on the screen right now is my defining assembly that this smart component is going to be created in. So I like to keep my assemblies as simple as possible so that it's easy to open if editing is needed and it's not used anywhere else so accidental edits don't happen. I use the whole series tool in Smart Fasteners to add the hardware and the holes. So these features are available in SOLIDWORKS Professional and above, but they're not necessary for the creation of smart components. It just made my life easier in this defining assembly. Hey, Dane, speaking of keeping your life easier, that looks like it's going to be hard to get at with a, with, a, with a wrench. Oh, yeah. No, I thought my job as an engineer was to make manufacturing's life miserable. I thought that was <laughs> part of my duties. Teamwork. But, but yeah, so <laughs> you're, you're not the first one to point that out to me, Tim. So... Um, the thing is, is that it's way easier to make the change in SOLIDWORKS than it was in PowerPoint. So it is actually fixed in SOLIDWORKS because it was just changing one dimension. But in PowerPoint, I had to redo the screenshot, relink them, and resize, and ugh, just didn't want to deal with all the formatting that came along with it. However, I guess if I used Composer to make this, then that would have some automatic updating as well. But uh, hindsight's always 2020. <laughs> But yeah, get, getting a wrench in that nook there would, uh, yeah, not not fun. But I, I love to have those comments with manufacturing, though. Just 
I, I get lonely sometimes in design world. So I like it when they call me, even if it is just to yell at me and tell me I did a bad job. <laughs> so that was the, the smart assembly. So to create an actual smart component, you have to go to your drop down menu, hit tools, and then there is a make smart component. And again, you do that when you are inside the defining assembly. So once you're in the property manager, the first step is to pick the component that will be the smart component. In our case, it's gonna be this bracket part, which is blue in the graphics area. The next selection box contains all of the components that will be added to the assembly once the smart component is activated. In this window, I selected all of the bolts, nuts, and washers. This is key because it will save me from having to add this hardware to every joist connection that I have. And in big structural steel assemblies or multi-body weld mid parts, there's gonna be a lot of those joists in there. So again, just little ways to keep saving time and it always adds up. So the last and final step is to define any features you wanna to add to the smart component. This can include material removal created from a cut extrude, revolved cut, or the whole wizard tool. We can see during this selection stage, all the components are hidden, revealing the holes underneath. In this example, we're gonna grab that cut extrude feature that was used to generate this hole. So now that I've shown you kind of the steps to create the smart components, let's see it in action inside of SolidWorks. I'm just waiting for everyone's screen to catch up to mine. Oh, someone's got bad internet. <laughs> um, I'm there. So ben. We're good? Cool. Yep. Right on. So this is my assembly. So I'm in the assembly environment and I pulled in this weldment part. And again, this would generally be much larger, but I'm just keeping it simple here. And I'm gonna use my insert components and I'm gonna insert that smart component. So it is in fact this bracket here. So I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna mate this into place. And usually it takes three mates to mate something. Nice little select other in here to grab that back face and my control select method for mating is my favorite way. I find it the fastest. So this is in the position that I want it to be. So now I need to activate the smart component. So you can do that by clicking on the part itself. And we can see this nice little lightning bolt icon in there is telling me that in fact, this is a smart component. When you click on the part, you get this little insert smart feature button that appears, but I took too long to click on it. So let's go and click on it. And then it's going to activate the smart feature. And it's gonna say, I'm gonna add some cut extrudes and this huge list of components in there, all the hardware. And it's like, all I need from you, Dane, is just, okay, where's the back face? Where's that nut gonna press up against? And I'll come in here, click on the back face, and I'm getting my little ghosted preview, looking pretty good, hit my check mark, And there we go, I have all of that hardware added for me. It is organized with that smart feature. So each one of the brackets will have the hardware kind of foldered inside of it, but they are all available for your bill of materials, whichever way you'd like to describe that. So a nice quick way to add features and hardware for again, redundant tasks. Boy, Dane, that, that is an awesome technique. You know, I remember when that was added to SolidWorks a few years ago, and, and I don't see as many people using it as, as maybe we ought to be. I recommend taking a look at that tool. It's just an awesome way to insert components, features, and additional parts all in, all in one shot. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Anytime I'm kind of scoping out people's workflows, this is one of the first things I work for, and most people that I show it to love it. Like, holy, I spend so much time just putting in the hardware doing these redundant tasks when SolidWorks has the built-in tools to automate them and people just are unaware of them. Yeah, super good point. So that kind of concludes our section on library features with the little added bonus of smart components. We're now going to get into 
equations, and global variables. So for this section, I wanted to show a design that was entirely derived from equations and global variables. My first instinct was to do pipe schedules because the wall thickness and diameter are all functions of the schedule. But then I remembered the routing package and decided not to reinvent the wheel because SolidWorks Premium already comes with all of that pre-configured for you. So I was stumped, I was sitting there, I was thinking. And then I noticed this picture of Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man hanging in my office. So if you're not familiar with this sketch of Da Vinci's, it's a drawing based on the correlations of ideal human body proportions. These proportions are all expressed mathematically, which will be easily translated into SolidWorks. So let's take a look at how I can use equations and global variables in SolidWorks to build a Vitruvian man of pretty much any height. So I'm in the SolidWorks environment now. And what I did is I took that JPEG that I stole off the internet, or I could have taken a photo of my wall, but this one is nicer because it's got the built-in dimensions and it already reminded me of SolidWorks because I unfortunately cannot read the Latin up here, which tells you all these proportions and correlations. So someone translated it for me. So this is the image I chose to import. So if you're not familiar, you can insert images into a SolidWorks sketch. So I'm still in my 3D SolidWorks environment. It's as if I just took a piece of paper and I plopped it down on this nice little sketch plane. So to start off this design, I just wanted to build in all of the relations and all these relative proportions. So I did that in here just with some construction geometry. So all these hard black boundaries are sketch entities. And then I used my smart dimension tool to throw in some dimensions and then related the dimensions to each other using equations. So this Vitruvian man, all of these proportions are based upon the height. So what I decided to do is make a global variable for the height and then relate everything else to the global variable. So you can see from the middle finger to the wrist over here, that's one tenth the height. From the knee to the hip, that's about a quarter of the height and so on and so forth. So if you're unfamiliar with global variables and equations, I'm gonna show you kind of multiple ways on how you can create them. So first off, when you're in the modify box of your smart dimension tool, all you have to do is hit the equal sign. And what that does is brings you into equation mode. So it's really similar to a cell inside of Excel. You can type in characters, or if you hit the equals bu button, it turns into functions. So I can come in here and I can grab my global variable of height. And I'm gonna say, okay, this is going to be one sixth the height. So I'm gonna divide it by six and I'm going to hit my check mark and there we go. So now this little arbitrary line I made is one sixth the height. So when I change the height, this line will change. Everything will stay within proportions. So another way that you can do that is to come in and actually use the equations window. So if I right click my equations here, I can manage them. And I'm just gonna pull everything to the right so we can see it. Use my screen here. And I can see all of my global variables. So I defined a global variable of height. And then I have all of my dimensions defining a global variable. And then I like this window because I can put comments in here. So when I come back to it, I know what each one of these dimensions are. So lots of people love to rename their dimensions. So instead of it being D2, it could say distance between whatever. But I, I just left it all there in the comments for some easier syntax on the left-hand side there. So you can even add equations in this window here. So your first column is like the left-hand side of your equation. So I'm gonna click in there and I'm gonna choose my dimension. So this dimension is going to equal, and I'm gonna come in here, put my global variable and say, okay, divided by seven. So that will be one seventh. And then I hit my green check mark. I have automatically rebuild on. So the rebuild closed my sketch, but let's come in here. And let's open that up again. And we can see this has that sigma value. So you can define it right in the graphics area. You can define it in that table format, whatever makes the most intuitive sense to you, whatever you find is going to be the fastest. 
So this kind of construction geometry here is going to lay out all of my proportions. And then I made this nice little sketch over top, which I can then start building my surfaces upon. So these are gonna be my overall sizes and I will use this geometry here to build my surfaces. But we're just gonna live in sketch land right now. So I can prove the point of proportional design or equations, things like that. Not, not really a surfacing exercise, maybe for the next webinar. So what I wanna do is I wanna see if I am a Vitruvian man, if I'm proportionate enough. So I'm gonna make a new configuration of this sketch or of this whole part file. So I'm gonna add a configuration. This configuration is going to be six foot three inches because that is how tall I am. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back into my equation manager here and I'm going to change my global variable. But now since I have configurations, I can choose to change it for all configurations or specific configurations. And this is a nice way to populate different versions of your part, either as you need them, or as we'll see later, we can use Excel to automatically propagate them. So I'm gonna say, okay, just for this configuration, and I have my six foot three inch configuration active, I'm gonna say this is six feet plus three inches. And I love how SOLIDWORKS can do math right inside all of these windows, makes life so easy. So I did that and we can see my Vitruvian man kind of layout sketch here grew and it still looks proportionate. So I was coming in here and I was like, okay, let's test some of these, these measurements here. So the first one I did was from my middle finger to my elbow and I measured that out and I was like, oh, okay, it's supposed to be 18 and three quarters, I got 20 inches. I'm like, oh, everyone always tells me I'm so gangly and long and flaily. So this is kind of supporting that conclusion. But then I did some, some more of these quarter height ones. So from the chest to my top of the head and, and I got this, the same number there, I got 20. So I am proportionate, I'm just not Renaissance Italian proportionate. So I'll chalk that up to my Scandinavian jeans there being nice and tall and, and slender. But the whole point of this exercise is to show you that you can change your global variable and if you build your dimensions relative to that global variable or even relative to each other, then you can create different versions of your part by changing one number. So if you have some design standards that are really setting the scale of your part or setting the relations and proportions of your part, equations and global variables are a great way to capture that so then as you make design changes, all of those rules and proportions will update accordingly. So our next section is gonna kind of go hand in hand with this, but it's going to be using design tables to automate and configure your designs. So design tables use Microsoft Excel to create and control configurations of a SolidWorks part or assembly. With a design table, you can manipulate your dimensions, color, custom properties, material, and the suppression state of features. You can also use the full power of Excel to derive these changes. So you can use functions, you can use logical statements. And my favorite tool, the fill tool, which is that little black box in the corner of a cell, that lets you continue an equation down or a numerical series. So that's really good if you have configurations that need to be within a range of something. You can use the fill tool and automatically populate them very, very quickly. So inside of the design table, which is kind of a little example here on the screen, the rows, so left to right, that represents your configurations and columns up to down, are the parameter to be manipulated inside of that configuration. So the column headers have a specific syntax that needs to be followed in order to communicate effectively with SOLIDWORKS. For custom properties or SOLIDWORKS properties, a dollar sign needs to be in front of it and of course spelling counts. So that's what gets me all the time when I try and manually populate my design tables. I usually spell stuff wrong. But spoiler alert, 
there's a nice trick where that doesn't matter. So custom properties need the dollar sign. For dimensions, you have to put the dimensions name, the at sign, and then the sketch that that dimension's in. And then if you're in an assembly, the part that that dimension's in and the feature. And it, it sounds kind of complicated, but fortunately, there's a trick to automate the creation of the columns you want. If SolidWorks detects a difference of a parameter between any of the configurations, it can automatically create it for you inside the design table. So honestly, that's how I make all my design tables. So in the example, I'm going to demonstrate that workflow. So in this example that I'm going to show you, I'm gonna copy some existing data from Excel into my design table to generate a configured weldment profile for most stock lumber. So SolidWorks Weldments comes with a vast library for metal structural members, but it also works well for carpentry and structural woodworking. So these are the steps we're gonna create. I'm gonna make my new sketch for the weldment profile. I'm gonna configure some sketch dimensions just so then there's a difference. And then I'm gonna create my design table and I'm doing it in that order so the design table will automatically propagate. Then I'm just gonna copy some data from another table, paste it in, rebuild it, and voila, everything should be the way that I want it. So on my screen now is SolidWorks and this is my weldment profile. So you might be looking at it being like, whoa, there's a lot of sketch points in there but I love to have the flexibility to put the center line or the sweep line of my weldment profiles wherever I need it to be, especially in woodworking when you're changing sizes. You usually need some quarter marks, half marks, just so then the edges line up flush because of course you have to point SolidWorks to the center point, not the edge boundary. So what I'm going to do is configure some of my dimensions. So I'm gonna do that by coming in here and I'm going to configure. So I'm gonna right click on the dimension, configure the dimension, it'll pull up my configuration table, add the other dimension I want in there. And I'm gonna come in here and just make this temporary configuration. And I don't really care about the values, I just wanna change them so then SolidWorks can detect a difference between them. So that's good, I'll hit apply. Now I have two configurations that are slightly different. I have my new temp configuration and my original default configuration. And they're slightly different. So now I can come in here and I can insert my table, which is going to be a design table. Now this is key. I'm gonna make sure that I'm gonna let SolidWorks auto create it. If I have the blank radio button selected, then I'm gonna have to type in all that syntax. And the procedure that I did previously is gonna be irrelevant. So I'm gonna auto create and I want new parameters, new configurations. So I wanna make sure all of that is checked on. I will hit my checkbox. And there we go, SolidWorks has pulled up Excel for me. Hey Dean, that, that's an awesome workflow. I appreciate you showing it in this way because I think this is the easiest way to build these is to, like you said, configure it first and let SolidWorks build the table for you. Totally, yeah, it saves me because I am a terrible speller. So I either spelt the dimension name wrong or when I'm putting it into Excel, I'm gonna spell it wrong. So that has caused me so much grief that this is the way that I do it every time now. So yeah, and, th and then you don't forget anything either. So on the left-hand side, this is the design table populated by SolidWorks. On the right-hand side, this is just some information that I downloaded from the internet for converting the imperial size to the actual metric size. So the first thing I wanna do is I'm gonna grab these imperial sizes for the lumber for the name of the configuration. So the very first side is the name. I'm gonna paste that in there. I'm gonna put the description as the same thing. Color I don't really care about. And then I'm gonna come over here and grab these metric values here, and then I'm going to paste them in across. So these dimensions up here are going to be written to these values for these specific configurations on the side. So this part's always weird. 
All you have to do is just close that table and then SOLIDWORKS will come up and it will say, okay, Dane, this design table has generated the following configurations. And I'm like, yes, that's exactly what I wanted. I'll hit my check mark. And now I have a whole bunch of configurations. So I can double click and I can test. And there we go. I got my one by three, my one by four, two by four. That's the most common. That's the one everyone always says. And you got some four by sixes if you're building a deck or something, but all the common ones in there. And of course I can just go into that table, add more, or just configure those again and use my configuration table. So to add on to this example, I'm going to use the design table to write a custom property. So I want this custom property to be the area of the cross section. So since you cannot do functions in the property manager, but I can in Excel, using a design table is the ideal workflow for this task. So back into my SOLIDWORKS here. So what I mean by that is I'm gonna come up here to my file properties and I wanna do a configuration specific property and I'm gonna call this metric area. And then normally, you know, you could come in here and you could say like equals and you try and get the dimension to pop up and you put the dimension in there. And then I'm like, yeah, 140 times this dimension. And then it doesn't solve. It just puts in the exact symbols I'm putting in there. So for now, I'm just gonna put a placeholder value and I'm doing this so then my design table will automatically propagate that column for me again. So I'm just gonna put it in arbitrarily as 100, and then I'm gonna do the math inside of Excel. So I can access my tables here in my configuration manager, and I'm gonna right click the design table and I'm gonna edit it in a new window. And then SOLIDWORKS will flag me. It's like, hey, there's some differences here. Do you want this temp configuration in there? Or do you want part number? I don't want that but I do want the metric area to come up. So I'm gonna select this parameter and I'm going to add that specific column. So now in here in Excel, I can see that column has been added, gonna make it a little bit bigger and then I can put in some functions. I can say, okay, this is going to equal that value times the length times the width. And then I can use the fill box right here and I can get it to calculate everything very quickly for me. So that looks good. I have that metric cross section or the metric area. I will close that. SOLIDWORKS needs a nice little rebuild. And then I can see in here that all of these have the appropriate value to them. So if there's a drawing that's referencing that or a note, or maybe that parameter is driving something else, some costing information, who knows, whatever you need it for, it now exists and I populated it pretty much instantly instead of having to manually do it for every single configuration. So that is design tables, nice little crash course. The next thing we're gonna look at is DriveWorks Express. So DriveWorks Express is one of those hidden gems inside of SOLIDWORKS that everyone has, but no one really uses. It is, in my opinion, the best way to automate designs when you use them with equations. DriveWorks is great if you have a configurable design with an infinite amount of possibilities. You can create the designs automatically based upon the customer's requirements as you need them. You can use DriveWorks to create a SOLIDWORKS part, assembly and drawing file all based on the new configuration. A DriveWorks product is created in three simple steps. You capture, you create your input form, and then you build your rules. So let's take a deeper dive into the process. So the first step in creating a DriveWorks project in the SOLIDWORKS environment is telling DriveWorks what you would like to capture and make changes to. So you can manipulate components, their configuration, dimensions, custom properties, and reference drawings. These drawings will be used as a template to create a new drawing for the newly created versions of the product. 
All dimensions, notes, and views will be created with their appropriate associations. The next step is to create input forms to enter product requirements. So validation controls are used to ensure inputs are always suitable for where they're going to be used. So if you need a, a range between a certain number or a specific number of significant digits, you can always put that in, in a tooltip and use the validation controls to make sure that the input's are actually going to work. You can have drop-down lists, numeric text ranges, check boxes or spin buttons to create whatever user experience you want. You can make the forms as complex or as simple as needed with customizable tooltips for clarity. And then the final step in creating a DriveWorks project is to build the rules to link input values with captured parameters. The rules can be as simple as writing an input value to a captured parameter or extremely complex with functions and logical statements. You can say, if parameter A is this, then parameter B has to be this, and you can make it as complex as your design process needs. So let's take a peek at what exactly that looks like inside the SolidWorks environment. So here I have this hydraulic cylinder, and depending on use case, it could be thicker, could be longer, could have different fixtures here. So this is kind of my master assembly, and this has all of my components. And then the DriveWorks project, after I run it and get the specific input, is going to suppress certain components and change sizes of captured dimensions. So you can find DriveWorks Express in the Evaluate tab of your command manager, and it's all the way on the right-hand side called the DriveWorks Express wizard. So clicking on that opens this nice little tab here. And I'm just going to kind of run through again the, the three steps. So the first step is capturing. So I have said that I want to potentially make a change to all of these assemblies or components. These are the few dimensions I want to change, custom properties that I want to change, as well as the specific drawing reference. Then I have my input form. So we're gonna see what the input form looks like in a minute when I actually run this, but I can come in here and you can see what it looks like. You can have text box, numeric text box, spin button, check box, everything like that. And then finally, all of the rules that you put in. So this specific project has 74 rules, um, 16 for file names, 41 for custom properties. We're just gonna take a peek at some of the dimensions here. So you can see that some of them have some complex if statements. And then some of them are really simple. It's like, okay, it's just this input value plus eight, or this input value plus three, plus two. Whatever you need it to be, you can put it in there. So once you're done, you hit your run button, and then this is kind of what your window looks like. So this was drawn by me. My bore size, let's do three and a half. Stroke length, put it at 15. Then my clevis type, maybe I'll do a universal clevis pressure range, pretty high pressure, port size can come in here. So again, this is all restricted by that drop down box. And then all I have to do is hit create. And DriveWorks is going to create all those files based upon all of the rules that I have. So we can see here my window's going to flash a whole bunch. I'm making a bunch of parts. So it says these files are all getting created successfully custom properties are being changed. And this is all based upon the input. And then we can see right here, my drawing is being made as well. So you can imagine how long it would take to go through all of that information, recalculate everything, remake all the parts, remate them all together, all of that on fun stuff. When I can just let DriveWorks go off this master model, take the initial legwork to build in those rules, and design criteria, and then I, I never really have to do it again. So we can see in here, this brand new drawing was made. All of my custom properties were updated. So this is all the input information. So the technical specs that I got from the client. And then down in here, my bill of materials and everything gets updated to the way that I want it to be. So that's, that's really cool. 
that is DriveWorks. Um, the cool thing about DriveWorks is that they put all of their examples on their website. So th this is a project provided by DriveWorks. I've done some of my own, but they weren't as cool as this one. So I chose this one instead. But you can go to their website, you can download their examples, and you can kind of reverse engineer, play with them, and get a better understanding for how DriveWorks actually works. But that is DriveWorks Express. We also have different levels of DriveWorks. So just like SolidWorks has different levels, DriveWorks has different levels as well. So up from the Express is what's called DriveWorks Solo. So it has a more intuitive user face, feels a lot cleaner. It's not so restrictive and Windows 95-y looking. Um, there's improved rules builder. So you got more options in there. You can automate a little bit more with the drawings. You can change the position of views. You can change the scales. You can even add or remove annotations in there instead of it just being a carbon copy of the drawing. You can automate some more advanced features. You can swap the master model. So based upon the input criteria, you can look at different master models. They can be static or dynamic. And then you can create some additional documentation as well, like quotes, bill of materials, and different letters, all the, based upon the information in there. So, so yeah, go ahead, Tim. I was just, just going to say, Dan, it really takes that Express tool to a whole new level. And what's kind of cool is you can take that Express product or the Express project that you've developed uh, and bring it over into Solo and enhance it with some of these extra extra options totally yeah and and then then you're you're gonna want it though once you try it <laughs> you're gonna want it you can't go back <laughs> so we're offering a a 30-day free trial of driveworks solo and you can get that by going on to our website so in the handout section of this webinar i have put a pdf of this entire presentation and this giant image here is a URL. You click on it, it'll bring you to the DriveWorks free trial. You give us this information that we probably already have because it's the same information of when you registered for this webinar. And yeah, you can get your hands on DriveWorks solo and see how far that can take you with, with automating everything. Yeah, that's a pretty cool option. I wanna thank everybody for joining uh, the webinar today. I know I certainly appreciate it. And Dane, you did a great job. Um, really helpful stuff there. Thanks so much. And thanks to all of you for taking a little bit of time out of your day to, to join us.